1611 or 1769. What is the Bible that you have, the King James Bible that you have? I'm going to answer that in this video right here. Um, I'm going to answer the objections and things there and, and some of the stuff that goes on with that. Back in July of 2010, a brother here on YouTube, I don't know if he wants to be named or not, so I'm not going to name him. Uh, you know who you are. Uh, he sent me this email here, this personal message, and he said, how do you answer? He's not a critic of the King James Bible. He's a you know, Bible believer. But he said, how do you answer the people that attack the King James Bible because of the different uh, revisions? And they say that the 1611 is not the same as the 1769. How do you answer them? And he sent a whole bunch of verses here and a whole bunch of word changes and things like that. And um, so that's what this video is going to be. How do you answer this argument of the different revisions of the King James Bible? Okay, I'm going to answer that in this video. Okay, so first of all, I'll just apologize to the brother that it took me from July till now to finally get to this thing. Okay, now, when you use the King James Bible, one of the arguments that the new perversionists will use is they'll say, oh, you use the King James Bible, which revision? Uh, you know, and, and what they want you to think there is that because there were different revisions of the King James Bible, then the, the new versions are okay because they're just other revisions. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Okay, and basically Whenever somebody comes to you with an attack, before you even think about the objections that they raise, what you first need to do as a Christian is you need to say, what conclusion are they trying to get me to? Okay, A atheist, when they come along and they say they attack all the Bible and they say they're contradictions and they attack things, what's the conclusion? What do they hope to, what's the end result that they hope to achieve by attacking the Bible to you. Well, they want you to deny the faith and to become a worthless, infidel, fool like they are. Okay, that's what atheists are. And these new versionists, they want you to reject absolute authority from the King James Bible and become an infidel and a wicked sinner like they are. Okay, that's their purpose. So that's what they really want. They're not, you know, and, and this brother that sent me this, this stuff here, he has a true concern. Hey, what about these revisions? That's fine. That's absolutely fine to come out with that. But when you have people using it as an attack on the King James Bible, their purpose is, if they can destroy your faith in the King James Bible, then you'll become uh, a sinner like them and say, any version's okay. So watch out for that. All right? Uh, their desire is to get you to doubt the King James Bible and to use and to be okay with any Bible. See, that's the end result there. Don't fall for it. And I'm going to show you actually that there is really no argument. Okay, These were not, these revisions, so to speak, were not actually revisions as in we need to update the text and you know make it newer and more understandable to today's reader. That wasn't it. The philosophy is totally different behind the supposed revisions here. Okay, what they were doing is they were correcting printing and publishing errors. And you go, oh, see, there's errors and stuff, you know. The new versions will try to use anything that they can to attack the Word of God, just like an atheist. It's kind of interesting because an atheist and a new versionist both will come to the same conclusions in regard to supernatural authority in the King James Bible. Kind of weird, isn't it? But uh, there were three types of changes that were made from here, the 1611, this is a this is a photographic reproduction, I'm going to show it in just a little bit, to here, your modern King James Bible that you can get in the store today. There were a number of corrections. Now, why were there corrections? Well, first of all, let's look at the three types of corrections. First of all, you have the font, the typography that was used in 1611. They used Gothic font. The Gothic font is very different from our modern day Roman font that we're used to seeing. Secondly, there were typographical errors. And we're going to look at that in a little bit more detail in just a minute. And third, there were spelling errors. Okay, The English language was still 
it was at its height in 1610, I believe, but, or excuse me, 1611, but the spelling of certain words was not yet standardized. That didn't happen until later. So there were words that were spelled differently in 1611 than they are today. So the spelling had to be standardized. That had to be updated. There was no change in verse and doctrinal changes or anything going on. Okay, there were different errors that were a result of the way they had to print the King James Bibles in 1611. Okay, they didn't have all of our modern day technology with laser printers and computers and everything else. They can spell check and they had a very primitive form of printing, which I'm going to talk about more later. Okay, now the first type of change, the typography. Okay, most of your um, typography we had the Gothic font in 1611. Okay, that's what's used here. Okay, you can see a picture of it there. That's what the thing looks like. Now, when you have the Gothic font, when it was changed to the Roman font, there were problems that were raised. Okay, the Gothic S looks like a Roman F. The Gothic U looks like a Roman V. Now, obviously, they had to go through and they had a lot of corrections that they needed to do there. And you'll hear about this. You, you know, the new perversionists, they'll say that there were thousands of changes, thousands of changes, you know, and, and it's not even the same Bible and all this other stuff. They don't tell you what the thousands of changes are. They just lead the deceived person that hears them. They lead them to believe that you couldn't even read a King James Bible, you know, 1611. Uh, yeah, you can. Uh, it's not easy, but you can read it. You could carry this thing if you wanted to, you know, and, and read it. Uh, I don't recommend that, and I'm going to show you why in just a little bit. But uh, so you have typog typography changes. That was one of the changes. And of course, yeah, there were thousands of changes. That's what happens when you change the font. Okay, a lot of changes. Now, did any doctrine change? No, no, no doctrine changed. So you had them switching the printing of the King James Bible in 1612, they switched from the Gothic font to the Roman font that we use today. That was the first change. Uh, the second change, in 1629, you had Dr. Samuel Ward and John Boyes uh, came along and they, they had read and had gone over and they marked down areas and stuff where it should be changed uh, where there were errors that the printers made, not errors that they had made, but errors that the, the printers had made, and they came along and they said, here are some places that words were left out, that you guys, you didn't, you left this letter out, or you left this out, or whatever. You need to fix these errors. Okay, now here's the significant part about that. Both Dr. Samuel Ward and Dr. John Boyce, too, he was also a very learned man, they were both two of the original translators of the King James Bible. Okay, so they were very qualified to correct the errors that the printers had made. Okay, now, before I go on, I just want to explain, and I'm, I have a couple uh, links here at the end. I'll talk about it a little bit more in, in a few minutes here. But in 1611, they had to manually set every letter into a frame and then that frame was like this they had these all the letters and then they put the sheet of paper on top of it they push it underneath the press the thing comes down the guy pulls the lever you know I have some videos where people are actually using the old presses over in in uh, the Gutenberg Museum there Gutenberg uh, being the very first man to create the printing press but imagine setting all of those, every letter of scripture, setting them all by hand into a mold. Just amazing. But it gets worse than that. They had to do it backwards. You see, because when the page came down and they, they printed it, they you know put the ink on the, on the metal letters sticking up and then they printed the page on it, it's like a mirror type of image where if you, if you want it to come out right, the letters have to be spelled backwards. Now, don't you think that there's a possibility that there would be some error there? That occasionally they might leave a word out that should have been in, or they might spell a word wrong, or whatever? 
Yeah, of course. The text was fine, but the printer, there's error there, okay? That doesn't make it the, the Word of God bad. It doesn't make the translation bad. It just, I mean, try doing that. I mean, it, it's just incredible. And there's, you know, again, I have another video at the end of this. You know, I'll show, the, I, I have the links down here in the description box. But there's a, a modern day guy that actually uses wooden letters and then he prints things on them. Just amazing. I mean, you talk about an art form. And that guy, he takes those letters and he puts them in the mold backwards so that they print correctly. And then he goes and he has a box, and you can see this in the video, it's just amazing. And he takes out metal shims. And he puts little metal shims in there to make sure that the letters are spaced perfectly and that the lines are perfect and everything else. I mean, you talk about an art form. And to do that with the entire text of the Bible and come out without any errors at all, uh, it's just about impossible. You know, I mean, people need to have a little bit more grace for the, the printing technology back then. And they say, oh, there were errors. That proves the King James Bible's wrong. No, no, it doesn't. It proves that they had a very primitive form of technology back then, a very primitive form of printing technology. And it took a long time. You read through the entire Bible. You know, that, there are people, it takes them a year to do it. You know, it's not an easy task. And to go through and to go over every single word and, oh, they missed one here and they missed... That's what was going on. It wasn't intentional. It wasn't that there were doctrinal errors or things. They left words out because of the primitive technology that they had. Let me continue here. 1638, the first typographical error revision was in 1629. 1638, by 1638, they had 72% of these errors errors fixed that they found 72 percent okay takes a long time to go through the bible and proofread it very long time okay and uh, you say well what about the words well i'm going to show you an example here in just a minute but it would be very easy to leave out a word by mistake okay now i want to show you from the 1611 and compare it with the modern King James Bible, I want to show you one of these places where they left out two words, two very important words. Okay, so let's take a look. All right, here you have the original 1611 King James New Testament photographic reproduction of the original. Barely make that out down there. I'll zoom in later here, but this is not a reprint. This is a photo scan copy. Uh, it's very interesting. Look at this. Let me zoom in here. I'm going to show you one of the these uh, places where they messed up the text because of the way that they had the the printing technology that they had. Here you have First John 5:12, and it says, "He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son, it should say of God, hath not life." Let me show you real quick here in the. King James Bible of today, he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Now, that isn't an intentional thing where they were trying to deceive people here in verse 12. It would be very easy. See, you come to the end of the sentence here, and they say, you know, they, who knows? I mean, I, I'm not, I don't know. They, but they left out of God. Now, that was a printing error. And this was corrected as time went by. The translators came in. They said, oh, wait, wait a second here. As they're reading through the text, hey, you forgot of God here. And the printer goes, oh, man, you know, we'll put that in. Don't worry about it. This is not an intentional thing or, oh, it was added to and it's not the same. No, it's a mistake. They left the word out by mistake. Remember, they're doing, they're putting all of these, every single one of these little letters here, is being put in by hand. It's a little metal die that sticks up and they're doing it backwards so that when the paper comes down, it will be printed the right way, like the mirror image, okay? I mean, have a little bit of grace here. Could you put all of these letters in by hand, backwards through the whole Bible? Imagine the work that it took to put together, I mean, it would be difficult doing this verse here, okay? Just, just one verse from the Bible, putting every single one of those letters in 
backwards so that it would be printed the right way. So there you see it, okay? And you know, the new versionists are gonna use that and they're gonna say, see, you know, the 1611 was corrupt. They, they left out of God, you know, on, on purpose. No, they didn't. Give me a break. The printers made an error. I mean, that's obvious, okay? Don't be ridiculous. And, and let me just give you a modern day example. Uh, my video, The Real Bible Version Issue Exposed. Here is the first edition, okay? I made the first one, and then I actually took it over to our Bible study on, th on, a, on Thursday night that we have at our church, and we all sat around and watched it, and we critiqued it, okay? And we said, ah, that's, the text is a little bit bright. It's a little hard to read. Um, this, you know, uh, you don't really come out all that clear. There's a little bit of a skip there. There's, you know, we went through the video and critiqued it. And I came out with another edition. And there were some problems with this one. And, you know, I'll go through a couple different publishings of my DVDs before I come to the final product. You know, and then and I have to design this, and sometimes this doesn't work out. The, the artwork for the DVD, there's a lot of work that goes into making one of these DVDs. And you will go through different revisions. Okay? That's just the way it is with any product. I mean, you write a book... You, you do anything, you're not going to get it perfect the first time. Okay, you need to have a little bit of grace for that. If you're a new versionist and you attack the King James Bible and you say there were multiple revisions, have a little bit of grace. Okay, these things that were left out and words that were left out and spelling changes and whatever, it wasn't on purpose. I mean, come on, not an argument at all. But all total, from this 1611 to your modern day King James Bible, all total, without the, the typography changes, the font changes, the spelling changes, all total, the textual problems where the printers left out a word or left out something important, they were only able to find 400 of them in the entire Bible. Only 400. Okay, there are 1,200 chapters in the Bible, so that would translate to one every three chapters. One typographical error for every three chapters of the Bible. And yet, the new versionist comes along and they attack the King James Bible because of the 1611 being different than the newer one that we have here. They attack it, and then they say, we should accept the new versions, that the new versions are just a modern, updated King James Bible. And they'll say, see, there were revisions from here to here, and so then these revisions are okay. Uh-uh. You see, because from here, 1611 to 1769, there were only 400 changes. Actual changes of real substance. Okay, words that had been left out by the printers in 1611. But from the King James Bible to the NIV, there were over 60,000. Okay, at a minimum. 60,000 changes. And as I've shown and demonstrated in various videos, the NIV is not from the same Greek text as the King James Bible. This is a Catholic Bible. Catholic uh, updated you know, version is what this thing is. Many of the readings in here exist in the 1610 Dewey Reams. Watch my other videos. This is not an updated King James Bible. And to use the argument that the changes from 1611 to 1769 somehow try to justify the new versions with it, that's a stupid argument, okay? Not an argument at all. Uh, before I forget here, I, I forgot to, to mention that uh, then there were spelling changes. Um, of course, the words, the standardization of the text, and there were two years there, um, the final being 1769, when all the spelling changes, all the textual changes and everything else, everything was corrected, and that's right here, okay, the King James Bible that we currently have. All right, so for almost 300 years, the King James text has been standardized, okay? Less than 300 years, I realize, but it's, the point is, it was all fixed up by 1769. And by the way, track church history, 
and things were really going well for the body of Christ from 1611 to 1769. There were a lot of great men in that time period. But look what happened after 16, 1769. Just incredible. I mean, you go up through after the Revolutionary War and, you know, Declaration of Independence and everything here in America, missions, churches, evangelists just exploded. I mean, just incredible. The most incredible time period in all of church history, and it was because of this book, all right, the 1769 edition of the King James Bible. Okay, now I want to cover one more thing here before I quit, and that is, should we call this 1611? Some people say, uh, you know, 1611, the AV 1611, I use the AV 1611. Well, in a matter of speaking, you don't. Okay, because right here is the AV 1611, the real one. And this isn't your modern day King James Bible. Okay, but let me make a point. You say, well, then it's wrong to say 1611. No, it isn't. Um, if you go to a gun shop and you ask for a 1911 45 automatic what that 1911 45 automatic is based on is in 1911 there was a man john moses browning who created a pistol for the military uh, called the 45 automatic the 45 browning automatic pistol okay and it's called the 1911 but the interesting thing is since 1911, this pistol has had some of its earlier issues and problems revised and everything. Until now, you have the modern 1911 is a very excellent pistol, extremely expensive. But if you would go to a shop, a gun shop, and you would say, you'd walk in, you say, I'd like to see a 1911. They aren't going to tell you, well, you got to go to the museum down there and see, you know, an original they aren't going to say that. They have newer ones that are the same pistol, but they're just improved. Okay? The modifications have been very slight. And by the way, if you have an old 1911 and you have the new 1911, they both will achieve the same result. Okay? <laughs> and if you have this and this, they're also going to achieve the same result. This is a more refined version of this. But that doesn't mean that the new versions which come from the Catholic text, that doesn't mean that they're now somehow okay. So is this a problem? Is this some kind of an issue that, oh well, because there were, were revisions made that now, now we should you know, be okay with the new versions? That's not an argument. That's not even close to being an argument. Okay? You have a King James Bible. I personally don't go around saying 1611 1611 you know but that is when the bible got its start okay and that bible you know i believe that the translators this is the bible that they wanted right here in 1769 the one that we you know it was refined up to that point but because of the very primitive printing technology that they had back then there were problems and they corrected the problems it wasn't, they didn't give us a new Bible. Okay, you're going to come to the same conclusions reading the 1611 as you do the, the 1769. They didn't give us a new Bible. And it doesn't, you can't use that as an argument to justify the wicked Roman Catholic versions. But if you want to read more about this, if you want to study more about it, I have here a great article by Pastor David F. Reagan, um, BibleBelievers.com. He really gets into it, really explains it well. I have the link down in the description box. Then I have a one of the old time presses, you know, and, they, and the guy demonstrates how you print a page of scripture. I have the link to that down there. I also have the Gutenberg Press demonstration where they actually show the old Gutenberg Press in the museum there. And there's a German woman and she's speaking and, and she actually shows the, the technique of how they printed. Um, very interesting video here on YouTube. You can watch that. Also, I have the modern printer showing his typesetting, how he gets in there, and all the little shims and everything. Very fascinating, very interesting. And just, I mean, watch the thing and think to yourself, the entire text of the Bible, every letter, 
putting it in backwards. Just amazing. It's incredible. Um, and then if you say, well, I'd really like to get my hands on a copy of this original 1611 uh, photographic reproduction. It's not a reprint. It's not somebody that printed it. This is a original. They only have the New Testament. I wish they had the whole Bible, but they only have the New Testament. But you can buy this thing. I think it's $25, if I remember correctly. But I also have, it's lifelineprinting.com uh, slash Bibles. I have the link down in the description box. So if you really would like to get a copy of one of these, it's not that expensive. And you can get it. Uh, it's, it is beautiful. You know, I'll, I'll say that. It's, it's amazing, the beauty. And just, you know, to, to open up this 1611 and just to admire it and to think of how these men printed this Bible and to imagine yourself putting little metal pieces in with, with a letter on the end of it and doing it backwards to print this. Just, just amazing. Absolutely amazing. So, again... Don't let these new versionists try to wreck your faith in the King James Bible. Okay, to say that this is a revision and that we should justify the new versions, that's a stupid argument. Okay, you can't use that. It doesn't mean anything. And it just shows, once again, that the new versions will, the new versionists, the people that promote the Vatican versions, they'll grasp at anything that they can to get rid of the authority of the book that calls them sinners. Okay, the Bible says that those that change things that are hard to be understood, that they are unlearned. So this King James Bible attacks the new versionists. That's why they can't stand it. That's why they hate this book. So don't fall for the attacks against the King James Bible. Let me just say one other thing here in conclusion. If you love the Word of God, you won't be bothered by persecution. You won't be bothered by the questions. When you have people that say, I'm, I'm King James only, and then they fall away, it's because the persecution came because of the Word. And instead of them saying, I love the King James Bible, I'm going to search for the answer to this thing. They'll get some question that they can't answer, and then they go, oh, I give up. I quit. Well, if that's the way you are, if you're a quitter, and you don't want to do any research, well, then, you know, we really don't want you on our side anyhow. <laughs> you know, go back to using the new versions. Go back to your modern church. Go back to the Catholic Church for your Bible. But if you love God's Word and you hear objections, what you need to do is you need to spend some time researching and getting answers to your questions. Don't quit on the King James Bible because somebody puts something to you and you can't answer it. Don't quit on the King James Bible. Okay, I can tell you right now, I've been researching this thing for 10 plus years now. And I've never seen one attack on the King James Bible that hasn't been answered. I've never seen one. Now, it takes time to study and time to answer, to get all the answers to the questions, the attacks on the King James Bible. It takes a lot of time. It'll take you many, many years. And again, that's why a lot of Christians fall away. I'm going to be doing a video specifically on this subject in the future, but don't let somebody wreck your faith in the King James Bible. And to the brother that sent me the stuff, I know you believe the King James Bible. Hopefully I've answered it in a way now that you know you can understand this thing better. There is no argument against the King James Bible and you know the 1611 to 1769 thing. It's not an argument. So that's it for now. Like I said, I've got some more videos coming up in the future that I'll explain things, more things in greater detail. Uh, so thank you for watching. Stick by the King James Bible. Don't let anybody talk you out of your faith in this book. The Lord has answers for every attack against His Holy Word. Thank you.